10. I woke up so slowly that at first I didn't realize that I'd been sleeping. In front of me, I saw a human face, a round face with a big forehead, combed back hair and small black eyes. The face was attached to a small, thin body and was looking at me closely. Hello, said the face. I'm Josephine. I had already guessed that this was Sophia's sister. Josephine was an ugly little girl, about eleven or twelve years old, who looked very like her grandfather. You're Sophia's young man, said Josephine. But why did you come here with Chief Inspector Taverner? He's my friend, I told her. Is he? I don't like him. I won't tell him things. What sort of things? The things I know. I know a lot of things. I like knowing things. She sat down and continued to look at me closely. Grandfather's been murdered. Did you know? Yes, I said. I knew. He was poisoned. With Esserine. She said the word very carefully. It's interesting, isn't it? I suppose it is. Eustace and I are very interested. We like detective stories. I'm being a detective now. I'm collecting clues. She was rather a strange child, I thought. I think there'll be a lot of changes here now, Josephine told me. We'll go and live in a house in London. Mother will be very pleased. Father couldn't afford it before. He lost lots of money on one of Mother's plays. Grandfather wouldn't pay for it. He said it would be a failure, but Mother didn't listen. I'm sorry the play was a failure, I said. Yes, Mother was very upset. The things they said in the newspapers were so bad that she cried all day and threw her breakfast at one of the servants, who left. It was rather fun. Are you sorry your grandfather is dead? I asked. Not really. I didn't like him much. He stopped me learning to be a ballet dancer. Did you want to learn ballet dancing? Yes, and mother and father didn't mind, but grandfather said I'd be no good. She stood up and danced a few steps around the chair. I suppose the house will be sold now, unless Brenda goes on living here, and I suppose Uncle Roger and Aunt Clemency won't be going away now. Were they going away? I asked curiously. Yes, they were going on Tuesday, said Josephine. Abroad somewhere. It was a secret. They weren't going to tell anyone until after they'd gone. They were going to leave a note behind for Grandfather. Josephine, do you know why your Uncle Roger was going away? I said. She looked at me slyly. It was something to do with Uncle Roger's office in London. I think, but I'm not sure, that he'd embezzled something. That means stealing money. Why do you think that? Josephine came so near that I could feel her breath on my face. The day that Grandfather was poisoned, he and Uncle Roger were shut up in a room together for a long time. They were talking and talking and Uncle Roger was very upset. He said he was a failure, and that he wasn't upset because of the money, but because Grandfather had trusted him. I looked at her. Josephine, I said, did you listen at the door? Josephine nodded her head. Yes, she said. You have to listen at doors if you want to find out things. I'm sure the police do. And they look in people's desks and read all their letters and find out all their secrets. But they're stupid. They don't know where to look. Josephine spoke coldly, as if she was better than the police. I didn't really notice the importance of what she said. The unpleasant child continued. Eustace and I know lots of things, but I know more than Eustace does, and I won't tell him. He says women can't be great detectives, but they can. 
I'm going to write down everything in a little black notebook, and then, when the police are completely confused, I'll tell them who the murderer is. Do you read a lot of detective stories, Josephine? Yes, lots. And do you know who killed your grandfather? Well, I think so. But I need to find a few more clues. She paused and added, Chief Inspector Taverner thinks that Brenda did it, doesn't he? Or Brenda and Lawrence together because they're in love with each other. You shouldn't say things like that, Josephine. Why not? They are in love with each other. You don't know that. Yes, I do. They write to each other. Love letters. Josephine, how do you know that? Because I've read them. They're very soppy letters. But Lawrence is soppy. He was too frightened to fight in the war. Just at that moment, a car arrived outside, and Josephine ran to look out of the window. It's Mr Gateskill, grandfather's lawyer, she said. I expect he's come about the will. Very excited, she hurried from the room. A few minutes later, Sophia and her mother Magda entered with a small elderly man. Your husband asked me to bring his father's will, the lawyer was saying to Magda. But I don't have it. Do you know anything about it? About poor dear grandfather's will? Magda opened her eyes astonished. No, of course not. He told us he'd sent it to you after he signed it. But the police didn't find the will with Mr. Leonides' private papers, said Mr. Gateskill. I'll just go and talk to Chief Inspector Taverner. He left the room. Darling, said Magda to her daughter, I'm sure that wicked woman upstairs has destroyed it. I know I'm right. Nonsense, mother. She wouldn't do a stupid thing like that, said Sophia. It wouldn't be stupid at all. If there's no will, she'll get everything. Shh! Mr. Gateskill's coming back. The lawyer re-entered the room with Philip Leonides and Chief Inspector Taverner. I've talked to the bank, the inspector was saying, but they don't have any private papers belonging to Mr. Leonides. I wonder if Roger or Aunt Edith knows anything, said Philip. Sophia, can you ask them to come down here? But when the others arrived, they couldn't help. Father signed the will, said Roger, and told us he was going to post it to Mr. Gateskill the next day. I sent Mr. Leonides his will ready for signing on November 24th, Mr. Gateskill said. A week later, he told me it had been signed and sent to his bank to keep it safe. That's right, said Roger eagerly. It was in November last year. You remember, Philip, that father read us the will. And what did the will say? asked Tavener. It was quite simple, said Roger. Father left £50,000 to Aunt Edith and £100,000 and this house to Brenda. The rest of father's money and property was going to be divided into three parts, one for myself, one for Philip, and the third for Sophia, Eustace and Josephine. And the money for the last two was going to be kept in the bank until Eustace and Josephine were twenty-one. I think that's right, isn't it, Mr. Gateskill? That is correct, agreed Mr. Gateskill, slightly annoyed that he hadn't been allowed to explain the will himself. Father read it out to us, said Roger, and asked if we had any comments. And Brenda said that she hated to hear her darling old Aristide talk about death, added Magda quickly. And when he was dead, she didn't want any of his stupid money. That's only what people of her class think they ought to say, said Mr. Haviland coldly. I realised suddenly how much Edith de Havilland disliked Brenda. And after reading the will, what happened next? asked Inspector Taverner. Exactly how and when did Mr. Leonides sign it? Roger looked round at his wife, so it was Clemency who answered the inspector's question. My father-in-law put the will down on his desk and asked two of the servants to come in, she said. He covered the will with a piece of paper so they couldn't read it, then signed the will and asked the servants to sign their own names under his signature. 
That's right, approved Mr. Gateskill. To be legal, a will must be signed in front of two witnesses, who must then sign at the same time. And then what happened? asked Taverner. My father-in-law thanked the servants, and they went out, said Clemency. Then he put the will in an envelope, and said that he would send it to Mr. Gateskill the next day. Do you all agree, said Chief Inspector Taverner, looking round, that this is what happened? There were murmurs of agreement. You say that the will was on the desk, continued Taverner. Were any of you near that desk? No, we were sitting about five or six yards away, said Clemency. And did Mr. Leonides get up or leave the desk after reading the will and before signing it? No. Chief Inspector Taverner took out an envelope and gave it to Mr. Gateskill. We found this with Mr. Leonides' private papers, he said to the lawyer. Please have a look and tell me what it is. Mr. Gateskill looked at the contents of the envelope with astonishment. I don't understand, he said. This is the very same will, but it isn't signed. Perhaps it's just a copy, suggested Roger. No, said the lawyer. No, it's the very same will that I prepared for Mr. Leonides to sign. There is a small mark on the paper that I noticed at the time. I swear it's the exact same will. But that's impossible, exclaimed Philip, speaking with more excitement than I'd heard from him before. We saw both the servants and my father sign the will. Father couldn't see very well, but he was wearing his reading glasses that evening. Yes, I remember that too, agreed Clemency. And nobody, you are all sure of that, went near the desk before the will was signed? asked Taverner. Nobody went near the desk, said Sophia, and Grandfather sat there all the time. Then I don't see how the will was changed, said Taverner. Perhaps the signatures were erased or rubbed out, Roger suggested. But we would still be able to see signs of that, said Mr. Gateskill, and there aren't any. The family looked at one another. We were all there, said Roger. It just couldn't have happened. Mr. Haviland coughed. But it did happen she remarked. What I'd like to know is what happens next. It is an interesting legal problem, said Mr. Gateskill. This will, of course, cancels all previous wills, and a large number of witnesses saw Mr. Leonides sign it. Taverner looked at his watch. Oh, I'm afraid, he said. I must go now. Everybody stood up and I went quietly towards Sophia and asked if I should go too. Yes, I think that's best, agreed Sophia. I followed Taverner out of the room and saw Josephine outside in the corridor. She appeared to be amused about something. The police are very stupid, she said. Chapter 11 I arrived at my father's office at Scotland Yard to find Chief Inspector Taverner talking about the case. I haven't discovered anything at all, he was explaining sadly. I can't find a financial motive. They all have enough money. And there's no evidence that Brenda Leonides and Lawrence Brown were having a love affair. I can do better than that, I said, sitting down. Roger Leonides and his wife Clemency were planning to go abroad. Roger and his father had an emotional interview on the day of the old man's death. Aristide Leonides had found out something was wrong, and Roger admitted it. How do you know that? demanded Taverner. A private detective told me. I explained to them about Josephine and how she thought Roger had been stealing money from his company. It sounds as if the child knows everything that happens in that house, my father commented. If this information is true, it changes everything, said Taverner. If Roger was stealing money from the company and his father found out, then Roger had a motive for killing him. Brenda Leonides was out at the cinema. 
All Roger had to do was go to his father's bathroom, empty out an insulin bottle and fill it up with esserine. Or perhaps his wife Clemency did it. She admitted that she went over to Aristide Leonidi's part of the house, and I think she's quite capable of poisoning someone. I still don't think that Roger would use poison to kill someone, I said, but I agree that Clemency might. I had liked Roger. I don't think that Clemency cares about money, but she does care about her husband. For him, she could be, well, ruthless. The next day, Tavener and my father had news. Roger's company, Associated Foods, is definitely going to go bankrupt soon, reported Tavener, looking pleased and slightly excited. It's been badly managed for years. By Roger Leonides, I asked. Yes, he's in charge, said Tavener. But we don't think he's been stealing money. He just doesn't know how to run a business properly and has made lots of bad decisions. Roger was only in charge of such a big company because he was Aristide Leonides' son, my father remarked. He's been stupid, added Tavener, but he hasn't done anything against the law. So why commit murder? I asked. Associated Foods needs a lot of money quickly to stop it going bankrupt, explained Tavener. Roger inherits a lot of money now his father is dead. Though he won't get the money in time, the banks will give him credit and the company can be saved. Why didn't Roger just ask his father for help? I asked. I think he did said Tavener, and Josephine overheard, but the old man refused to give Roger the money. I thought that Tavener was right. Aristide Leonides was a generous man, but he didn't like to waste money. He had refused to give Magda the money to produce her play. I thought it was unlikely that he would give Roger enough money, probably hundreds of thousands of pounds, to save associated foods. The only way for Roger to avoid financial ruin was if his father died. It was a strong motive for murder. I've asked Roger Leonides to come here to my office, my father said. He'll be here soon. Sure enough, Roger soon arrived, clumsily bumping into a chair as he entered the room. In fact, he was so clumsy that I couldn't imagine him putting esserine into an insulin bottle Surely he would have dropped the poison or broken the bottle. You wanted to see me, said Roger eagerly. Oh, hello, Charles. I didn't see you. Have you found something? My father spoke coldly and officially, telling Roger about his legal rights and asking him if he wanted a lawyer. Roger looked confused. But why am I here? he asked. I've told you everything I know. You did not tell us about the conversation you had with your father on the afternoon of his death, said Tavener, about associated foods. Roger sat down suddenly, holding his face in his hands. I didn't think anybody knew about that. You need to tell us the truth, said Tavener. Will associated foods go bankrupt? Yes, admitted Roger. The company can't be saved now. I wish my father had died without ever knowing about it. I feel so... ashamed. My father trusted me with his biggest company, and I failed him. Why did you and your wife plan to go abroad without telling anybody? asked my father. I, I didn't do anything against the law, said Roger, but I, I didn't want to tell my father about it. He was so fond of me, and would offer to help. But I'm no good at business or managing a company. I've been so unhappy. I just wanted to escape from it all. Clemency, she's a wonderful woman, agreed to go away with me without telling anyone, so we could live somewhere simply and quietly. I see, said my father slowly. So... Why did you change your mind and ask your father for help? Roger stared at him. But I didn't, he exclaimed. My father found out himself. 
when he asked me about it, I told him everything. The dear old man was so good and kind to me. He insisted on giving me the money to save Associated Foods, and wrote to his bank straight away. Your father agreed to help you? asked Tavener, astonished. Yes, I've still got the letter, said Roger. I forgot to post it. I was so shocked and confused after father's death. He looked in his pockets. Here, he said, finding the letter. Read it yourselves, if you don't believe me. My father and Tavener read the letter eagerly. I read it later. Roger had told the truth. Aristide Leonides had asked his bank to give Associated Foods enough money to save the company from bankruptcy. What did you do after your father wrote this letter? asked Tavener. I rushed back to my own part of the house and told Clemency what had happened and how wonderful my father had been. About half an hour later, Brenda came rushing in saying that father was ill, just as I told you before. So you didn't visit your father's bathroom at any time? my father asked. I don't think so. No, no, I'm sure I didn't. Why? You don't think that I... My father stood up and managed to interrupt. Thank you, Mr. Leonides, he said, shaking Roger's hand. You have been very helpful, though you should have told us all this before. When Roger had left, I looked at the letter. So Aristide Leonides was going to help Roger, said my father. That means that Roger had no motive for murder. In fact, he paused, if Aristide Leonides had lived a day longer, Roger and Associated Foods would have been all right. But because he died so soon, the company will now go bankrupt. Maybe someone wanted Roger to fail, suggested Tavener. What about the old man's will? my father asked. Who actually gets the money now? Tavener sighed. The lawyers can't tell us. There is an old will, but it was cancelled when the new will was made. But if Aristide Leonides died without a legal will, then his wife, Brenda Leonides, gets everything. She's the most likely person to have played tricks with the will, though I still have no idea how. I didn't know either. We were looking at the problem from the wrong way round. Chapter 12 Chief Inspector Tavener left, and my father and I were alone. After a short silence, I asked, Dad, what are murderers like? Now that murder had come so close to me, I wanted to know more about his previous police experience. My father looked at me thoughtfully. Some of them, he smiled sadly, are very nice, ordinary people, just like Roger Leonides. I looked surprised. Oh, yes, he continued. Murderers can be ordinary people who want something so much that they kill for it. They don't think about what happens next. And some people, although they know that murder is wrong, don't feel that it's wrong. They think that it wasn't their fault, or that their victim deserved it, and they're never really sorry for what they did. Do you think, I asked, that someone could kill old Leonides if they hated him? Hated him for a long time? It's possible, but unlikely, my father replied, looking at me curiously. People are more likely to kill those they love than those they hate. Only people you love can make your life impossible. But this doesn't help you, does it? he added. What you really want to know is how to recognize a murderer in a house full of people who seem pleasant and normal. Yes, that's right, I admitted. My father paused to think. The one thing that all murderers have in common, he said finally, is that they are all vain. They are frightened of being caught, 
but they still want to show off about how clever they are, and a murderer wants to talk. To talk? Yes, because they're very lonely, explained my father. They can't tell anyone about what they did or how clever they are, and they will never be able to tell. So they like talking about the murder. I think, Charles, that you should go back to Three Gables and get everyone to talk to you. Everyone in the family, guilty or innocent, will talk to you, because they can say things to you that they can't say to each other. And if the murderer talks, he or she might make a mistake and say too much. I told him then what Sophia had said about how the family was ruthless in different ways. He was very interested. Yes, he said, most families have a weakness, and it sounds as if both the de Havilland family and the Leonides family have a different kind of weakness. But I wouldn't worry too much about that, Charles. The best thing to do is to go and talk to them all. Only the truth can help you, and your Sophia. As I went out of the room, he added, And look after the child, Josephine. We don't want anything to happen to her. I stared at him. Come on, Charles, think, he said. There's a murderer in that house, and Josephine seems to know everything that happens there. She certainly knew all about Roger, I agreed, and her story about what she overheard seems to be correct. Yes, said my father. A child's evidence is usually very reliable, even if we can't often use it in court. But children like to show off. If you want Josephine to tell you anything else, don't ask her questions. Instead, pretend that you think she doesn't know anything. But take care of her, he added. It's possible that she knows too much. Chapter 13 As I went back to the crooked house, as I called it in my own mind, I felt slightly guilty. I hadn't told my father and Chief Inspector Taverner what Josephine had said about Brenda Leonides and Lawrence Brown writing love letters to each other. I told myself that it probably wasn't true. But really, I didn't want to find any evidence against Brenda. I felt sorry for her, surrounded by a family who disliked her so much. And if there were any love letters, Taverner would soon find them. And perhaps Josephine was wrong. Though, when I remembered the intelligence in her small black eyes, I doubted it. I had phoned Sophia earlier. Please come, Charles, she had said. The police keep searching the house, and we're all very nervous. I'll go crazy if I can't talk to someone. There was no one in sight as I drove up to the front door, which was open. As I stood there, wondering whether to ring the bell or to walk in, I heard a noise behind me. I turned my head and saw Josephine standing by the hedge eating a large apple and looking at me. Hello, Josephine, I said. She didn't answer and disappeared behind the hedge. When I followed, I found her sitting on a wooden seat, swinging her legs. She looked at me coldly and didn't speak. Why wouldn't you speak to me when I said hello? I asked. I didn't want to said Josephine, still eating her apple. Why not? You sneaked to the police about Uncle Roger, she said. Oh, I said. But it's all right, Josephine. The police know that Roger didn't steal any money or do anything wrong. Josephine looked at me as if I was stupid. I wasn't worrying about Uncle Roger, she said. But surely you know that in detective stories you never tell the police until the end. Oh, I see, I said. I'm sorry, Josephine. I'm really very sorry. So you should be, she replied. I trusted you. I said I was sorry again, and Josephine seemed to forgive me. She continued eating her apple. But the police would have found out anyway, I said, because Uncle Roger will be bankrupt. As usual, Josephine knew what was going on. 
Father and Mother and Uncle Roger and Aunt Edith are going to talk about it tonight. Aunt Edith wants to give Uncle Roger all her money, though she hasn't got it yet, but Father won't. Again, I was impressed by how much she knew. Josephine, I said, you told me that you were almost sure who the murderer was. Well? Who is it? I asked. I, I promise I won't tell Inspector Taverner. I want a few more clues first, said Josephine, throwing away what was left of her apple, and I wouldn't tell you anyway. Then will you tell me more about the letters? I asked. What letters? The letters you said Lawrence Brown and Brenda wrote to each other. I made that up, said Josephine. I often make things up. It amuses me. I stared at her, and she stared back. Somewhere, not very far away, a twig snapped with a sudden noise. Rather late, I remembered my father's advice. Oh, well, I said, it's only a game for you. You don't really know anything. Josephine looked at me angrily, but she kept her mouth firmly shut. I got up. I must go and find Sophia now, I said. Come along. I'm staying here, said Josephine. No, you're not, I insisted, pulling her to her feet. You're coming in with me. Josephine seemed surprised, but decided to come in with me, probably to see how the family behaved when I arrived. It wasn't until I walked through the front door that I realised why I hadn't wanted Josephine to stay outside. It was because of the sudden snapping of a twig. Chapter 14 I heard voices coming from the big drawing room, but I didn't go in. Instead, I walked down the corridor towards the kitchen and pushed open the door. There I found Nanny, a large, cheerful old woman. I knew she had worked for the family for many years, looking after the children. It's Mr. Charles, isn't it? she said. Come in and have a cup of tea. I sat down in the big comfortable kitchen, and Nanny brought me a cup of tea and two sweet biscuits. I felt like a small child again. I felt that I was safe, and that everything was all right, because Nanny was there. Miss Sophia will be glad you're here, said Nanny. She's be getting rather overexcited. At that moment, the door opened with a rush, and Sophia came in. Oh, Charles, she said. Oh, Nanny, I'm so glad he's here. I know you are, dear. Nanny smiled to herself and went into the room next door and shut the door behind her. I put my arms round Sophia. Dearest, I said, you're shaking. What's the matter? I'm frightened, Charles, said Sophia. I'm frightened. Someone in this house, someone I see and speak to every day, is a murderer. If only I knew who it was. I didn't know what to say. I wished I could take her home with me, away from this house. And the worst thing is, she whispered, is that we may never know. I knew she was right, and that we might never know who poisoned Aristide Leonides. And then I remembered something I'd wanted to ask her. Tell me, Sophia, I said, how many people in this house knew about your grandfather's Esserine eye drops? and that they were poisonous if injected. That doesn't help, Charles, she said, because we all knew. We were all with Grandfather one day after lunch when Brenda put the Esserine drops in each of his eyes. Josephine asked why it said not to be taken on the bottle of eye drops, and Grandfather smiled and said, If Brenda made a mistake and injected me with eye drops instead of insulin, I would probably stop breathing and die, because my heart isn't very strong. Josephine said, Ooh, <laughs> we were all listening. We all heard him say it. So Aristide Leonides had actually told the murderer exactly how to kill him. I took a deep breath. Sophia seemed to know what I was thinking, and said, Yes, it's rather horrible, isn't it? Just then, Nanny came back into the kitchen. She must have overheard what we were saying. 
I think you should forget about such horrible things as murder, she said. Leave it to the police. It's their business, not yours. But Nanny, don't you realise that someone in this house is a murderer? said Sophia. Nonsense, replied Nanny. The front door is open all the time. Anyone could get into this house. She again went into the room next door. Come on, Charles, said Sophia. Let's go to the drawing room. There's a family meeting about Roger's business affairs. If you're going to marry me, you need to see what my family is really like. In the drawing room, all the family were there, except Brenda and Josephine. Philip's face looked cold and serious, while Roger's face was red and he looked annoyed. Clemency, who was looking at the paintings on the wall, looked calm and cool, and Edith was sitting up very straight doing some knitting. Magda and Eustace, both so good-looking, sat together on the sofa. Eustace's handsome face was unhappy. As Sophia and I came in, everyone stopped talking and looked at us. Philip frowned. Sophia, this is a private family meeting, he said coldly. I heard the click of Mr. Haviland's knitting needles. Charles and I hope to get married, Sophia said in a clear and determined voice. I want him to be here. And why not, said Roger. Charles knows all about it already. Do sit down, Clemency said. I looked at her thankfully as I found myself a chair. The family meeting continued. I think we should do what Aristide wanted, said Mr. Haviland. Roger, when the will is sorted out, you can have my money to help save the company. Roger pulled at his hair. No, Aunt Edith, no, he exclaimed. I suppose, said Philip, that I might be able to give you a little money. That's not very fair to our children, said Magda quickly. I'm not going to take anyone's money, Roger said excitedly. Of course he's not, agreed Clemency. Anyway, Magda added, Roger will have his own money when the will is sorted out. But surely he won't have the money in time to save the company, said Eustace angrily. Eustace is right, said Roger. Nothing can stop Associated Foods from going bankrupt. It's too late. He sounded almost pleased. And what does the company matter compared to the fact that father is dead? We are only trying to help, Philip said stiffly, his face turning slightly red. I know, Phil, I know, said Roger, but there's nothing you can do. It was all my fault. I was in charge. Yes. Philip said slowly, looking at him. You were in charge. Edith de Havilland stood up. I think we've talked enough about this, she said, with such power in her voice that everyone went quiet. It seemed that the family meeting was over. Magda and Eustace got up and left the room, while Roger put his hand on Philip's arm and said, Thanks, Phil, for trying to help. The brothers went out together, followed by Sophia, who said that she would get my room ready as I was staying the night. Edith de Havilland put away her knitting. She looked towards me as if she was going to speak, but she changed her mind, sighed, and went out after the others. I was left alone with Clemency, who was looking out of the window, and went to stand beside her. I'm glad that's over, she said. Magda arranged it all, just like a play. Act two, the family meeting. There was nothing really to discuss. She sounded pleased about it rather than sad. Don't you understand, she asked. We're free, at last. Roger has been unhappy for years. He was never any good at business, and it broke his heart because he failed his father. Roger loved his father a great deal. They all did. Clemency turned to look at me. It's ridiculous to think that Roger would have killed his father, especially for money. Roger was actually glad when he knew the company would go bankrupt. 
he was looking forward to our new life. Where were you going? I asked. To Barbados, she replied. A cousin of mine died recently and left me a small house and some land. We'll be very poor, but we'll be together, away from all Roger's family. And I don't mind not having much money. I don't like money. I was happy with my first husband when we were poor, and I didn't love him like I love Roger. She closed her eyes and smiled to herself. I could tell how strong her feelings were. And I was sure that Clemency meant what she said. She wasn't interested in money or living in luxury. Are you still going to Barbados? I asked. Oh, yes, as soon as the police will let us. When everything has been sorted out, we can leave. I hope it doesn't take too long. Clemency, I said. Do you have any idea who did this? Any idea at all? She gave me a strange look, and when she spoke, her voice sounded stiff and awkward. I'm a scientist. I deal with facts, not guesses. All I can say is that Brenda and Lawrence are the obvious suspects. So you think they did it? Clemency shrugged her shoulders, and stood for a moment as if she was listening. Then she went out of the room, passing Edith to Haviland on the way. Edith came straight over to me. I want to talk to you, she said, about Philip. I hope you didn't get the wrong idea about him. Philip is rather difficult to understand. He may seem cold, but he isn't really. I didn't really think, I began. She didn't let me speak. Philip is really a dear, when you understand him. You see, Aristide loved all his children dearly, but Roger, the oldest, was his true favourite. And I think Philip felt it, and though he always hides his feelings, he suffered, as children do. He's always been jealous of Roger, even if he doesn't realise it himself. So do you think that Philip is secretly pleased that Roger's company has failed? Yes, said Mr. Havland. I do think that, and it upset me that Philip didn't want to help Roger straight away. Why should he? I said. Roger is a grown man with no children to think about. If he was ill or very poor, his family would help. But I'm sure Roger would prefer to start a new life without their help. Yes, I'm sure he would, said Mr. Haviland, and so would Clemency. She looked at me. I realize that this is all very difficult for Sophia, she continued. I'm sorry that she has so much to deal with when she is still so young. I love them all, you know. Roger and Philip, and now Sophia, Eustace and Josephine. I love all my sister's children and grandchildren. She paused for a few moments. Yes, I love them dearly, but not too much, she added, before turning abruptly and going out of the room. I had the feeling that her last remark was important, but I did not understand it. Chapter 15 Your room's ready, said Sophia. We stood together, looking out of the window at the grey and windy garden. It was getting dark outside, and as we watched, two people came through the hedge and walked back towards the house. The first person was Brenda Leonides. She was wearing a grey fur coat and moved quickly and easily like a cat. As she passed the window, I saw that she was smiling. A few minutes later, we saw Lawrence Brown walk through the hedge. It didn't look as if he and Brenda had been for a normal walk. There was something secretive in the way they returned to the house. I wondered if it was Brenda's or Lawrence's foot that had snapped the twig. That made me think of Josephine, and I asked Sophia where she was. 
She's probably with Eustace in the schoolroom, Sophia replied. I'm worried about Eustace. Why? She frowned. He's behaving so strangely lately, since he's been ill. I don't know what he's thinking. Sometimes he seems to hate us all. He'll probably change as he gets older. It's just a temporary thing. Yes, I suppose so, said Sophia. But I do worry, perhaps because mother and father don't. I didn't notice until I came back from the war, but they are a strange couple. Father lives in the past with his history books, and mother makes everything into a scene from a play. She arranged that meeting tonight because she was bored and wanted a dramatic scene. Forget about your family, Sophia, I said firmly. I wish I could. I was happy in Cairo when I could forget about them. I remembered that Sophia had never mentioned her home or her family. Is that why you never talked about them, I asked, because you wanted to forget them? I think so. We're all too fond of each other, and we all live too closely together, all together in a little crooked house. We haven't grown up separately and become independent. We're all tangled together and have grown up crooked. I remembered Edith de Havilland grinding the weed under her foot, just as Sophia added, like bindweed. And then suddenly Magda burst through the door and turned on the lights. What an incredible scene that was, she said. Eustace was so annoyed. And I love it when Roger gets angry and pulls his hair. And Edith really meant it when she offered Roger her money. She'd do anything for this family. It must have been hard for her after her sister died, I remarked, especially because she disliked old Leonides so much. Disliked him, interrupted Magda. Who told you that? Nonsense. She was in love with him. Mother, said Sophia. But she herself told me, I argued, that she always disliked him. She probably did when she first came here, said Magda. She was angry with her sister for marrying him, but she was definitely in love with him. I know I'm right. Edith didn't like it when he married Brenda. She didn't like it at all. You and father didn't like it either, said Sophia. No, of course we didn't, said Magda. But Edith hated it most. I've seen the way she looks at Brenda. Then she added, on a completely different subject, I've decided to send Josephine to school in Switzerland. It's not good for her to be here at the moment. I'm going to arrange it tomorrow. Grandfather didn't want Josephine to go to school, said Sophia slowly. Darling old grandfather liked us all to live together, but I think that Josephine should be with other children. Switzerland is such a healthy place. It will be good for her. Magda stood up, smiled, and went towards the door. Children must come first, she said as she went out. It was a lovely exit line. Sophia sighed. Mother is annoying when she gets a sudden idea. Why should Josephine be sent away to Switzerland in such a hurry? It might be good for Josephine to go to school, I said. Grandfather didn't think so, argued Sophia. I was slightly irritated. Did such an old man really know what was best for Josephine? I asked. He did know best, insisted Sophia, though I admit that Josephine is rather difficult. She likes to sneak around and spy on people, but only because she's playing at being a detective. I thought about how Josephine seemed to know everything that happened in the house. Perhaps Magda had another reason for suddenly sending Josephine to school. Switzerland was a long way away. Chapter 16 As I washed my face the next morning, I thought about what I'd learned. People had talked to me just as my father said they would. The only person who hadn't talked to me was Philip Leonides. I thought that was strange, especially as he knew I wanted to marry his daughter. 
Edith de Havilland had told me that Philip had been an unhappy child, jealous of his brother Roger. Could Philip have killed his father? Not for money, but so that Roger would be blamed for it. I looked at my face in the mirror. What was I trying to do? Prove that Sophia's father was a murderer? That wasn't what Sophia wanted. Or was it? Did Sophia herself suspect her father, and was she bravely trying to find out the truth? What did Edith de Havilland mean when she said she loved the family but not too much? And why had Clemency looked at me so strangely before she said that Brenda and Lawrence were the obvious suspects? Everyone in the family wanted Brenda and Lawrence to be guilty, but they didn't really believe it. Of course, Brenda and Lawrence could really be guilty, I thought. Or it could be Lawrence and not Brenda. That would be better. But that was only what I wanted to be true. It wasn't necessarily the truth. Still, I wanted to talk to Lawrence Brown. So, after breakfast, I decided to visit him in the schoolroom. As I went into Brenda's part of the house, I noticed that none of the doors was locked, and there was no one to see me as I went into Aristide Leonidi's bathroom. In the bathroom, I looked in the cupboard and found the bottles of insulin and syringes. Everything was clear, well arranged and easy to get to. It was impossible for the police to find out who put the eye drops in the insulin bottle. Anyone could have done it. As I went through the house, I didn't see anyone else, though I heard Edith de Havilland talking on the telephone. When I got to the schoolroom, I stopped outside the door to listen. I was behaving just like Josephine, I thought. I was very surprised to hear Lawrence Brown talking with amazing imagination and enthusiasm. He was an excellent teacher. And although I didn't hear Josephine say much, when Eustace spoke, he showed that he was both interested and intelligent. After a while, the lesson ended and Eustace and Josephine came out. They looked surprised to see me, but while Eustace waited politely, Josephine went past me uninterested. I told Eustace I just wanted to see the schoolroom, and he opened the door for me. Lawrence Brown looked up and then quickly left the room. You frightened him, said Eustace. Do you like him? I asked. Oh, he's all right. He knows a lot, and he's a good teacher. He makes you see things differently. We talked for a while about history and poetry. Eustace, though he seemed to be bad-tempered, was an interesting person to talk to. I soon realized that he was bad-tempered because of his illness, which had been frightening and difficult for him. Before his illness, he had been enjoying his life and his time at school. I wish I was well enough to go back to school, he told me. I was going to be in the football team. I hate staying home and having lessons with Josephine. She's only twelve. I said that Josephine was quite an intelligent girl for her age. I don't think so, said her brother arrogantly. She's pretending to be a detective at the moment, sneaking around and writing things down in a little black book. It's just silly. Mother is quite right to send her to school. Won't you miss her? I asked. Miss Josephine? Of course not, said Eustace. She's only a kid. Really, all my family are impossible to live with. Mother's always making a big drama about nothing, and father's shut away with his books. I remembered how sensitive and embarrassed about my family I had been when I was sixteen. What about your grandfather? I said. Do you miss him? A curious expression showed on Eustace's face. All Grandfather thought about was how to make money, he said. He was too old to enjoy his life properly. It was time for him to die. He... Eustace stopped as Lawrence Brown came back into the schoolroom. Uh, please be back here at eleven, Eustace, said Lawrence. We've wasted too much time in the last few days. Okay, sir. Eustace went out, leaving me alone with his teacher. Lawrence Brown was looking at me nervously. How are the police getting on? he asked. His nose twitched, 
reminding me of a mouse in a trap. Are they going to arrest anyone soon? I don't know, I replied. Lawrence became even more nervous. You don't know what it's like, he said quickly. N not knowing what the police really want. They keep asking strange questions. I let him keep talking. What Chief Inspector Taverner suggested about Brenda Leonides and me, he continued, is just not true. The family has never liked me. His hands began to shake. They are rich and powerful, and I'm only a teacher. I, I didn't fight in the war. I knew I couldn't kill anyone. Everyone's always laughed at me. I always do things wrong. Everyone's against me. Whoever killed Mr. Leonides arranged it so that I would be suspected. What about Brenda Leonides? I asked. Lawrence's face reddened, and he suddenly behaved less like a mouse and more like a man. Brenda Leonides is an angel, he said firmly. She is sweet and kind and would never poison anyone. The police are ridiculous if they suspect her. He went over to a bookcase and began sorting the books. I didn't think he was going to say any more, so I left him alone. As I was walking along the corridor, a door on my left opened, and Josephine suddenly appeared in front of me. Her face and hands were very dirty, and there was a spider's web in her hair. Where have you been, Josephine? Through the half-open door, I could see steps leading up to a small attic. Josephine replied briefly, Up in the attic? Detecting? What is there to detect up in the attic? I asked curiously. I must wash, was all Josephine said, before going towards the bathroom. At the door, she turned back to me and said, I think it's time for the next murder, don't you? What do you mean, the next murder? I asked with surprise. Well, in books there's always a second murder about now. Someone who knows something is killed before they can tell anyone. You read too many detective stories, Josephine, I said. Real life isn't like that. The only answer I got was the sound of water from a tap, so I left Josephine to wash. As I went back to the other part of the house, Brenda came out through the drawing-room door and put her hand on my arm. Well, she asked, looking up at my face. I shook my head. I don't have any news. I'm so frightened, she said. Charles, I'm so frightened. Her fear was very real. I could feel it. She was so alone. I wanted to help her, to make her feel safe, but there was nothing I could do or say. I suddenly felt that Sophia was watching me, and remembered her saying, Yes, Brenda does seem to get on well with men. The inquest is tomorrow, Brenda said and I'm sure there'll be newspaper reporters there. Just don't talk to them, I said. Perhaps you should get a lawyer, Brenda, to look after your interests and advise you what to say and do. You see, I added, you're very much alone. Her hand held my arm more closely. Yes, she said. You do understand, Charles, and you have helped. I went downstairs feeling warm and satisfied. Then I saw Sophia standing by the front door. You've been a long time, she said coldly. Your father telephoned. He wants you to go back to London. Did he say why? Sophia shook her head. Her eyes were anxious. Don't worry, darling, I said, putting my arm around her. I'll soon be back. 